Today we're going to start a four-week series uh, called Lessons from Ananias and Sapphira. I hope you're ready for it. Um, anyone familiar with those two people? We're going to get a little bit more familiar. I, uh, as I was reading preparing, I, I didn't think I'd ever come with a four-week series on this message. It seemed like it was pretty self-explanatory, but as always, when you ask the Holy Spirit to show you, the Holy Spirit will show you, and um, I'm looking forward to it. So go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 5. We're going to be reading the first 11 verses in the scripture for the next three weeks following. We're going to read the same 11 verses of scripture. Um, so uh, my challenge to you is that by March 14th, when we end this, um, I just hope you can quote it for me. And uh, we'll just move on from there. But starting in verse 1, it says, But there was a certain man named Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles. Now, real quick, if you want to go back to chapter 4, just to give a little bit of context, it says that the church was coming together, had everything in common. They never saw any of their own stuff as their own. It says, in fact, when somebody had need, they would sell their stuff to give to them. They didn't look at their property, their home, their finances, their bank account as their own. They looked at it as the corporate whole. And so it says that Barnabas had just done this. He had just sold some property and gave it for those in need. And so now we find ourselves in verse 1 with Ananias and Sapphira. And it looks like they're following in the same steps as Barnabas. But uh, we see quickly it didn't quite turn out that way. It says they brought part of the money to the apostles to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. They brought part, but claimed it was all. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. I love this, man. How many of you know that's accurate? With his wife's consent, he dealt with the money. <laughs> yeah, that's funny to me. Okay, apparently I'm the only one who finds it funny that 2,000 years ago, men still had to ask their wives about finances. It is a um, human uh, reality uh, that's going to happen until we get to heaven, I suppose. But with his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? What a tough correction right off the bat. How tough. How tough to come and to say, this is what I'm doing for God, and to immediately say, why is Satan in you? Why has Satan filled your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. I love that, because I think we get caught up and say, well, it was his property, his money. Why does it matter? This is the context as to why. It was his choice. He wasn't forced or told or twisted into doing anything. It was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. If you think today we're talking about um, specifically lying, you're, you're right a little bit, but there's more to it. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. I would be too. <laughs> I would be freaked out. We just hear a story. A man's coming in to the apostles to give them money from property sold, and all of a sudden they're dragging him out dead. I would be terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Little plug-in, men talk to your wives. <laughs> she didn't know what happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for the land? It's a trap, right? Like Peter is now playing a role. I've, I've done this. Um, I've asked my son's questions that I already knew the answer to, right? We do it. It's, it's just give them opportunity to be honest. In fact, God did this to Adam and Eve when they're walking through the, the garden after they sinned and ate the apple. He said, why are you hiding? <laughs> he already knew. He already knew it was an opportunity to be honest and upfront about what was going on. And so Peter gave them the same opportunity God has given us over and over again. So is this the same price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, 
she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Today, I want to, to break this down into to two simple points, but with one complete understanding. What has been hidden cannot stay hidden. It can't stay hidden. It can't happen. What, what we have tried to place in the dark can't stay there. It's impossible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 talks about this. It says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. It could just stop right there, and that would be pretty self-explanatory, but it goes on a little bit more. It says, everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. They can't stay hidden. The things in our life that we are trying to bring before God or before other believers or before the world around us and saying, this is who I am. This is the value I have to give. If we think that we can get away with that, if we think that we can portray a falseness, if we can keep things in hiding from what they are, it can't happen. It can't happen. We will be exposed. Nothing is hidden from God. And yet we, we try. We do this. I've, I've been guilty in my own life of trying to hide and keep in the dark the things which God has already brought to light. Can't happen. We cannot falsify before God who we are in our depths. Can't happen. We can't, we can't do it. Moses tried this with God at the burning bush. God called him to go to Egypt, and he said, I can't. I, I'm not well-versed. I have speaking problems. I'm, I'm not accepted. I'm, I'm a killer. Any excuse he could think, he threw out there. What was he doing? He was trying to tell God he had a different value than what God had already shown him to have. And we do the same thing. We try to keep things hidden or away from God, whether it be from trying to devalue ourselves so we don't have to move forward in the direction God has called us, or by trying to overvalue what we've done in order to justify the lives we've lived. What has been hidden cannot stay hidden. As it says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. It cannot hide from God. There's two points to this. You cannot hide from God. We understand this. Scripture makes it very clear that God is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He, he's omniscient. There's nowhere we can go that he is not there. There's nothing we can do that he has not seen. There's nothing we can experience that he does not understand. It can't happen. Everything is seen. Everything is understood and known by God. It cannot be hidden from God. There's no point in trying. How foolish would it have been if we went back and read in Genesis if God said, who told you you were naked? And Adam said, I just figured it out. I don't know. I don't know how I got this way. It would have been idiotic and moronic. Adam knew God knew. And yet we oftentimes will try to degrade the power of God and diminish it by thinking we can lie to him. And get him to believe the lives that we've, con we've convinced ourselves of as well. Can't happen. It's a mockery to God. He won't be mocked by our attempts to diminish his power and his might. He won't be mocked by our attempts to try to push away his, his true uh, knowledge and perfection and power. It won't happen. It's easier to just be honest. Who of you as either children or parents have looked at your kids and knew they were in trouble? You did the same question Peter did. Is this the same price you got? Is this really what you did? And we knew the answer. Get it a chance to be honest. And we had the follow-up question. It would be better to tell me the truth. Anybody ever heard that or said that in your life? Many times. I've told my kids, listen, you're in trouble regardless. I know the answer. You tell the truth, it's one swap. <laughs> you, you lie. It's two. We try to get this a point to understand that honesty is the way to be. Honesty is, is, is truth. It can't be hidden. It's already in the light. Own up to what's going on and grow from the experience. But when it comes to God, 
we think we're smarter or sneakier, or slyer. But the problem with that is the last time somebody tried to sneak around God, they were cast from his presence. You can't do it. He will not be mocked. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, don't be misled. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Can't stay hidden. Not only can you not hide it from God, you can't hide the harvest. We think we're really good at this and really sly at this. We think that we can plant these seeds in darkness, and when they came up, we can hurry up and gather them beforehand. We can't. We can't. The seeds that we sow in, in dark will grow into weeds in the light. It'll happen. The seeds we sow will grow into weeds. Scripture talks about weeds as a form of sin and as a form of, of, of uncleanliness and separation from God. It's truth. What we think we're planting in dark and keeping hidden isn't something that's going to provide any value into our lives. We can't sow seed in darkness and expect a beautiful forest or, or, or flower field. We're going to receive weeds every time. And it'll become known, and it'll become experienced, and it'll become witnessed. And what we thought we were hiding would now be brought to light. How much easier would it have been to have brought it before God? And you just simply say, God, you gave me the chance and the opportunity. You gave me the, the, the hope to not mock you, to just lay it at your feet and to be done with it because it was already in your light. But I instead tried to do it my own way, and it became known. You can't hide the harvest. You can't do it. You can't contain or control what has been missioned to destroy you. Can't do it. You understand, sin's mission only has ever been to destroy us. Scripture tells us that we have an enemy. His sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. So the sins that we try to hide in the dark are sent out in a mission from the enemy to destroy you. To destroy me. And we think that we can control and tame that. We can't. We can't control. We can't contain. We can't stop. We can't have power over when we act in it. The things that have been missioned to destroy us. It makes no sense. No sense at all. If we are going to be in its submission. To think we can be in its control. We can't control it. Not only... Can it not stay hidden? It can't stay contained. Can't stay contained. Luke 12, 3. Jesus says, Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the mountain or the house ops for all to hear. It can't be contained. There's been times in my life where out of frustration I've whispered under my breath. And the words that said weren't glorifying to Jesus or God, to family or friends. And we think that because we weren't caught in a moment, that we have somehow looped around God's guidelines. Won't be contained. If we, if we live a life thinking we can make decisions without repentance, it will come to light. And it'll either come to light between us and God with repentance and transformation and change, or it'll come to light between us and the world. This week, I don't want to give names, but a very popular apologist passed away. And what should have been a time of honoring and uplifting and celebrating this man's life instead turned into a place of suspect and um, in detecting and, and challenging and looking into his life to find out that all these years of speaking the word of God and talking about not keeping things in the dark had multiple times had affairs with other women around the world, had hired women and, and brought them in to, to have sexual relations with them, multiple it had been proven and found out. What was thought to be kept in the dark came to light. And it came to light after he was passed. But the sad thing is, is that 
I don't know what the last moment or stance of repentance was, but he is standing before God at this moment and is being brought to light again. It can't stay contained. Because you've gotten away with it now does not mean that you have had victory over it. It doesn't mean that you've won. That doesn't mean that you, you have outsnuck God. Sin will always take you further than you want to go, and it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Every time. Every time. It expects more and takes more from us than we ever bargained for. You can't contain that. What you try to hide will try to destroy you. Every time. What we try to hide, what we try to sneak, what we try to disobey from God will try to destroy us. It's the same thing that we see with King Saul in the early, early Israelite history with their first king. And God told him to destroy all, of the, all the Philistines and destroy all the enemy. And he left one alive. And what happened? It was the same hand that destroyed him and took his life. What we do not destroy will always seek to destroy us. Like I said, it's, it's its mission. It's what it's been sent out to do. It's its only agenda to still kill and destroy the children of God. God will not, he cannot, he never has and never will allow darkness to infiltrate the light. Jesus says that, that you cannot um, hide darkness from the light. The light will come in, it will infiltrate, it will destroy it. it. It is the sole truth and principle upon this world. It cannot, it cannot infiltrate the light. You must allow light to shine on what's been hidden in order to destroy its work on your life. Scripture for a reason says, go and confess your sins to one another. It says it for a reason. How easy is it for me, and I know because I have did it most of my life, to cry before God in the altar as sincerely as I can, not faking it, not putting on a show, truly heartbroken and destroyed and broken over my sins. I come before the altar of God and I cry for repentance and he forgives me and I get up and walk away. And that same day or that same week, that same month, I fall into the same sin again. Why? Because I've kept in the dark that which has sought to destroy me. When we confess to each other, it brings it into the light. It's not a form of humiliation. It's not a form of tearing down and mocking us and embarrassing us. It's a form of giving us victory over what the enemy wants to do. If he can hold us back, if he can shut us up, if he can keep us quiet and keep us tamed, then we will never beat him. It won't happen. It will not happen. If you need victory in your life, quit thinking you can contain the problem. You can't. You can't. Never can, never will. Scripture says only through Jesus. Take my yoke and my burden. Allow me to forgive you. My strength is sufficient. It's never mine. Always his. So if you think you can contain the problem, you are wrong. And no matter how many times you run to the altar alone, if you are doing it with the hope of keeping it in the dark, you will always fall victim to it again. Bring it to light. Destroy it. Give it to God and allow him to do what he wants to do because if you don't destroy it, it will destroy you. How many addicts have died to addictions? Ones who loved Jesus with all their heart, but they couldn't bring it to light anymore. They kept it hidden. They kept doing it on their own behind closed doors. Romans 2, 5 through 8 says, but because you are stubborn. I love that. I feel like that's how every correction I received as a child began. <laughs> you are stubborn. And refuse to turn from your sin. Like I said, if you think you can contain it on your own, keeping it in the dark, even with good intentions, if you have not brought it to light, you are refusing to turn from it. You're allowing the shame or the embarrassment or the humiliation to keep you from victory. So because you refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. 
For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. And it's easy to say, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not living for myself. I'm not living in wickedness. Are you bringing it to the light? Are you trying to hide it? Are you trying to contain it on your own? And it doesn't matter what motivation or hope you think you're doing it in. You are doing it wrong. It has to come to light. Confess to each other. Bring it in. Destroy what the enemy wants to do. Open your mouth when he wants you to shut up. Move when he wants you to sit. Love when he wants you to be cold. The enemy is going to do everything he can to stop you. And if it's keeping your pains and your skeletons in the dark and in, in the closet and hidden away, he's winning. He's winning. And if he's winning, then you are, in fact, being disobedient to the truth. You are, in fact, living out of wickedness. Can't happen. Give it to God. If you won't remove it, you will be removed. It'll happen. Scripture tells us over and over again on the same day when God comes to judge that he will separate them. The weed from the wheat. He will separate the wolves from the sheep. He'll, he'll do it all. He'll move them apart. And he's going to look at one. He's going to say, well done. Good and faithful servant. He's going to look at another. And he's going to say, I've never known you. Depart from me. Doesn't matter what we have said. It's not going to matter what acts we have done. If we have lived a life in the dark, it will be brought to light and it will be too late. If you don't remove it, you will be removed. And as I was reading this, preparing for this, actually, Scott, you want to come on up. God put a simple truth in my heart nothing valuable is ever hidden, it's never hidden. It's kept secure, but it's never hidden. Ladies, when you got engaged and you got that ring on your finger, what did you do? You flashed a little bling. It didn't matter if it was the worst ring in the world. <laughs> it, it could have been junk. It could have been one of those 25 cent old uh, candy machine rings. But you, you were going to flash it because it was valuable to you. Nothing valuable is ever hidden. Never. It's kept secure. It's kept safe. But it is never hidden. It's always made known. It's why God tells us to secure our hearts, to keep it safeguarded, our minds and our thoughts, to keep them safe and guarded and protected. Because we keep secure our relationship with Jesus, our faith, our hope, our joy, our peace, our strength. We keep it secure and safe, but we don't keep it hidden. Scripture says, who, who goes and puts a light under a bushel? We sing the song as kids, but it's true. Anything valuable is not hidden. It's kept safe. And so if you have to live before God or people and hide it, it's not valuable. It's not valuable. And yet we are risking the greatest reward we could ever receive in eternity and a hope with Jesus Christ for something that's not even worth showing people. The trade-off is not worth it. The trade-off of what is hidden instead of what is eternal isn't worth it. We have to hide it. It's not valuable. If it's not valuable, it's not worth being removed from the presence of God. There's only one time I see in Scripture that anything was worth separating from the presence of God. And you could say, what? I, I, I never. Never is it worth removing themselves from God. But there's one time I see it, and it's Jesus on the cross when the father turns away because he can't even look on him anymore. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
he became so indebted. He took every hidden thing, every dark thing, every deplorable thing in our lives and placed it on himself from the beginning of time to the end. And he took on every darkness and every sin and every evil on his shoulders to where the Father couldn't even look at him because where there is darkness, there cannot be light. And if God can turn away from his son, don't you dare believe for a second he won't turn away from you. But the only thing in this world that was ever worth separating from the presence of God was you and me. You and me. And yet we mock God by trying to hide what he already knows. We diminish his power and his might, his intelligence, his wisdom and knowledge and strength. We diminish all of it by thinking we can convince him of what's a lie. And we may think to ourselves, I'm not lying to him. But if you think you can keep it hidden, if you think you can keep it from him, if you think that you can go from never bringing it before his throne and bringing it to light, you are trying to hide it. It can't stay hidden. It can't be hidden from God. The fruit of it can't be hidden. It can't be kept from the world for long. It can't. It can't be contained. If you don't destroy it, it's going to try to destroy you. And if you won't remove it, you will be removed. It's a simple truth. The last thing I want is for God to stand before me one day and to say, is this the value of your life? Is this everything you gave to me? Is this everything you put out and did and served in? And for me to look at him and to hold back, is it him to say, is this every action and every word you ever gave? Is this every testimony you ever spoke? Is this every deed you've ever done? And for me to hold some behind my back that I don't want him to know about. And to say, yes, it is. And for him to look me in the eyes and say, you have lied to the Spirit. I do not know you. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want to be drug out from the presence of God. Because I had refused his presence over a few things that I was embarrassed and ashamed of. Do you? We cannot move closer to God. We cannot draw more intimate to Him if we are keeping things hidden from Him. Can't happen. When He knows you are lying to His face every day because you're holding things back from Him and we still try to tell Him how much we love Him and adore Him and worship Him and praise Him. He knows. And we cannot draw closer and more intimate to Him in those moments. So if you're, if you're sitting here and you're wondering, God, why, why am I not drawing nearer and closer? One of the challenges I would ask you is to say, well, what are you hiding? David said it best. Search me, oh God. Search my deepest, deepest parts. Bring them to light. And ask God to destroy in your life those things which are seeking to destroy you. Ask him to bring it to light. Listen, it's embarrassing. I get it. It is. It's humiliating. But if your preference is to look good before man and be ashamed by God, keep on doing what you're doing. But if you are seeking to honor and please and draw nearer to God, then it's going to take a little humiliation. It will. It's going to take some correction and guidance and being brought to light. But it will save our souls. It will save our eternity. And it will save our intimacy and relationship with Jesus.